Grant us, in the same Holy Spirit, to know what is right and ever to rejoice in his consolation. For it's taken from our collect today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today, we shall consider the fruits of the Holy Ghost, what they are, and how to obtain them, specifically by focusing on the first two sets, or first two divisions of those fruits. And St. Thomas Aquinas will be our excellent guide for this. As you know, the fruits of the Holy Spirit are 12. Charity, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, goodness, benignity, or kindness, meekness, faithfulness, modesty, continency, and chastity. We asked, what is the fruit of the Holy Ghost to begin with? Is it something that man does himself, that he produces, or is it something that's done in him? St. Thomas tells us that it's really both, that the fruits of the Holy Spirit proceed from the operation of the Holy Spirit working in man, but that, as we know, the Holy Spirit does not work in man without our cooperation, without our willing action and participation in his action in us as well. That's why they're called fruits, and that's why that concept of fruits is referred to by our Lord so many times in the Gospels. He tells us that by its fruit a tree is known, to say that man is known by his actions, by what he produces, by his works. He shows us in the parable of the talents of the gold coins that all the servants are given gold, which they don't produce of themselves, but by cooperating with that gift, it produces fruit, it multiplies. And the one who doesn't cooperate with the gift is harshly rebuked appropriately harshly. Similarly, he rebukes the fruitless fig tree. He curses it, curses the barren tree, which represents the hard-hearted Jews. And he warns us in a similar parable that a certain unfruitful tree was given three years, given plenty of time, all the care it could ever need, all the opportunities that it needed to cooperate with, and yet, if it would not cooperate with them and bore no fruit, it was destined to be cut down and thrown into the fire. The fruits of the Holy Spirit work the same way. A man cannot of himself directly produce them. Otherwise, the pagans and the heretics would be able to have the fruits of the Holy Spirit. But they cannot, because they don't have the Holy Spirit. He must, man, however, must respond to the working of the Holy Ghost within him. So the fruits are neither all dependent on man nor all dependent on God, but the produce of God working in man, man who cooperates with his inspirations and graces. Thus like that tree that receives those good things that the gardener gives it, the good care that he offers it. Now, what are the fruits, then? St. Thomas divides them into three basic categories, along three lines. He says that the mind of man is set in order, first of all, with regard to itself, secondly, in regard to things that are near it, our neighbors, thirdly, in regard to things that are below it, our lower passions. The fruits, in general, are dispositions of the mind of man, of man's soul the higher part of man. They are good dispositions, proper orientations, we might say, with regard to things that are good and also with regard to evil things. Charity, the first of the fruits, which St. John Chrysostom says stands first because it contains all the others. Charity is that disposition of the soul of man to love God produced in man by his cooperation with the Holy Spirit. As we hear in our gospel today, when man loves God and follows the commandments of Christ, without which we know there is no love of God, then the Father and the Son come and make their dwelling in his soul and give him the Holy Spirit. 
The fruit of charity is distinct from charitable actions, which are nevertheless necessary to produce it. It is the possession of God in the soul, the love of God in the soul. The second fruit, joy, follows immediately afterwards. For as charity is the presence of God in the soul, so we have joy when we possess that which we desire. And again, our actions contribute to the production of this fruit. For if we do not desire God, or if we don't desire and strive to follow his commands, if we do not orient ourselves within our powers towards God and away from love of created things, if we do not cooperate with the workings of the Holy Ghost in us, then we shall find, we shall not find, this joy produced in our soul, and will be tempted to find our joy in other things. When a soul cooperates with the commands of Christ and the inspirations of the Holy Spirit, after joy follows peace, the fruit of peace. For when we have joy in God and not in the world, then our soul is oriented rightly, it's ordered rightly, it's placed where it ought to be, right? Just like something in your house. If it's, you know, there's a cup that's balancing on the ledge, it makes you nervous. That's not where it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be over here. And when it's there, ah, now we have peace. I have contentment. Same thing in our soul. When our soul is ordered rightly, gets its charity and its joy from God, then the fruit of peace is present. St. Thomas says, if a man's heart is perfectly set at peace in one object, God, he cannot be disquieted by any other since he accounts all others as nothing. And so, with regard to the treatment of evil things, after peace follows the fruit of patience, when a man is not disturbed when he's threatened by evils, temporal evils. He can be patient because his love and joy are in God alone. And they have produced a peace in his soul, peace that the world cannot take away from him, that it cannot even threaten. And so he is patient with the evils of the world. This brings with it the fruit of long suffering, that peace of soul which is not disturbed if the evils persist, if good things are delayed, because it rests in God. It has the only good thing it needs. The second set of fruits, then, are the proper dispositions of a man's mind, of a man's soul, to what is near to him, to his neighbor. Thus, it is a product of both the action of man and the Holy Spirit that a man wills what is good for his neighbor, and this is goodness, that he is enkindled, to execute those good desires, which is benignity or kindness. As with above, the fruit of meekness is when he suffers with equanimity the evils his neighbor inflicts upon him. Meekness curbs anger. Lastly, in this set, is the fruit of faithfulness, fidelity, where a man refrains from doing or desiring harm to his neighbor, not only through anger, but also through, th through fraud or deceit. We shall hopefully consider the final set next Sunday. But for now, let us examine our souls. Are any of these fruits lacking in my soul? Am I impatient? Do I rankle? If I have to bear with something for a while? Am I swift to anger? Do I find myself falling into lying? Remember, there are many other spirits that are not the Holy Spirit. These spirits, too, can make an abode in your soul. So if you find that these fruits are lacking or that they're meager in our souls, we must first ask, have I chased out the Holy Spirit? Have I sinned gravely and not confessed it, not repented it? Do I have any habits of grave sin that I'm not willing to remedy? 
It's too hard. I'd rather stay in my habit. Am I a tree that refuses all the nourishment offered me? Am I like one who prefers to drink poison, to eat garbage, to breathe in poisonous gases, the evil smoke of Satan? Then it is no surprise if the evil spirits make their dwelling in your soul, and if they're producing lies and impiety, anger, resentment, pride, greed, lust, and so on. Because that's what they do. That will produce evil fruit. Now what do we say if we look in our souls and we find that those fruits are there, but only to a limited degree? They're kind of small and bitter, hard, unripe, hard for us to produce. Like that year that's really hard on your garden, you're like, ah, you're going to give me a little more. And it's like, nope, this is it, this is what you get. We must ask, if I am in a state of grace, then how fully am I cooperating with the Holy Spirit? The root of all these fruits are in the first set. Charity, love of God, joy in possessing God, peace in being centered upon God and the things of God. Have I done what I can, what I need to, to produce that fruit in my soul? Am I trying to get these other fruits? Am I trying to be patient, long-suffering, have all these other things be kind to my neighbor and good to him? How can I do that if I've neglected the most important ones have to do with God? If I haven't ordered things rightly, if I haven't taken advantage of good, healthy devotions offered me, or if I have spurned them for secular entertainments, have I gone to daily Mass when I've been able? Have I gone to confession frequently, to adoration? Or have I preferred to set my joys on created goods or to set them on them first and then to do only as much as I'm required? For if we only do what we are required to do, then yes, the Holy Spirit still lives in us in a little room there, but he struggles to produce much fruit in us. It's like one who is eating but not eating very healthy, or is breathing thin, heavily polluted air. He can walk, but it's with great effort that he even walks, and he sure can't run. And when he looks next to him, and he sees somebody, robust health, eating good, breathing good air, just doing the same thing that he's trying so hard to do, and just doing it easily, and he's just running the path of virtue. He's easily tempted to envy, to resentment, to impiety. Ah, there's something wrong with that guy. I want to mass more than once a week, make me look bad. He's too pious. He's too devout. He cares too much about God. Too much. You got, that's for Sunday. That's for Sunday. You know? In reality, it's because they reveal that his soul is poor and meager in a selfish state, producing small, withered, bland, or bitter fruit. So let us then take full advantage of everything that the Holy Spirit gives to us, of all his inspirations to make good habits, to do good things, to pursue those fruits in our soul, beginning with the first ones, beginning with our devotion to God. To follow the commandments, of course, to follow the duties of our state in life, to use all the gifts that he gives us, not just to walk the path of the commandments, not just to walk through our duties of state, just to do them kind of because you have to and begrudgingly, but to do them joyfully, to do them eagerly, to run down the path of the commandments, to run to our duties of state. Let us ask his help to increase our devotion. Again, so that instead of just trudging along this path, we may run down it, embracing all the good that the Holy Spirit so desires to produce in us. And of course, 
as in all things, you have no better example than our blessed mother. And if you don't believe me, then believe her. What did she do? What would she tell you to do? Her soul was in a perpetual state of accepting continual grace from the Holy Ghost. From the moment of her immaculate conception, she began growing. Her soul began growing in grace, producing fruit. She was producing fruit for those nine months while she was in the womb of her mother, St. Anne. And every time she produced more fruit, she'd multiply that, multiply that, going up exponentially. You imagine all the graces, all the fruit that was produced in her soul by the Holy Ghost in those nine, just in those nine months, going exponentially, then all throughout her whole life. Every single thing that came into her life, the good, the bad, everything, everything was taken up and increased the fruit that she produced such that even from the moment of her conception, she produced more fruit, more good for God than all of the other saints combined. Now, we may not have the advantage of being immaculately conceived, but we all have a choice. We all have those moments when we're tired. If we can't choose not to be tired, that happens. But we can choose to be kind when we're tired or when we're sad. We can't choose not to be sad. Good luck with that. But we can choose to love God when we're sad, to be good to our neighbor when we're sad. We control that. So let us ask our Blessed Mother's intercession to keep her close to us all the days of our life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.